Heavenly Father, be still our hearts. Allow us to find this, this place of rest with you. Allow for you to speak to us individually and, and corporately. We give thanks for your presence here. We give thanks for everyone who is here, that uh, we may be focused and have all attention and praise to you. In your precious name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Here's Ruth. <laughs> We begin each week by singing a song that helps us to refocus, to change gears, to turn our hearts towards remembering why it is we do this week after week. Our call to worship is a song that calls us to worship. It doesn't call God to meet us here because he meets us everywhere, but it calls us to focus, to remember the one who we honor this morning and to spend time together. So we begin singing your name. Let's speak together the words of Psalm 66. They'll be on the screen. These song, words were written thousands of years ago by people whose hearts were, were turned towards the same God who we worship this morning. Let's speak these words together. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. How great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land and they passed through the waters on foot. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Let's stand together and sing songs 
of praise and recognition of the power and the might of our God.
Jeff's, well, team, team member, I guess, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about himself, and he's going to share with us what God has put on his heart for us this morning. Rod. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So this is a little weird for me. I, uh, I work in campus ministry, right? So for the last two years, the campus has been pretty much entirely shut down so this is my first time not facing people through a screen so if i stumble or bumble over my words or you know use improper grammar or whatever because i'm not i'm not accustomed to actual people physical people in front of me but i'm really happy to be here i work with an organization called power to change i work in campus ministry uh, like ruth said i work with with jeff him and i are team members um, I've been doing that for 15 years, and students mean a lot to me because it was actually in university, my final year of university, that I heard the gospel for the first time, and it was completely transformative in my life. In fact, it had such an impact that I could only see one possible option for my life, and that is to bring the same message to other young people who, similar to me, had probably never in encountered it in any sort of meaningful way and since that day I've done I've done every single day on campus sharing the gospel Jeff and I are a good mix because I'm so outwardly focused um, evangelism outreach and Jeff is very pastoral right comes alongside people and uh, so the two of us work well together he called me I don't know maybe three weeks ago and he asked if I wanted to come down and, and speak to, to you guys. And I thought, yeah, sure, that'd be a great opportunity. But when I prayed, and I prayed, before, before COVID, I didn't have to wear these when I did something like this. Now I have to, like that's, that's crazy. I asked God, what do, what do you want me to speak to your people about? You might not like this, but I got a clear answer, and God said, I want you to speak about suffering. Suffering. Who hasn't suffered in the last two years? So kind of in pre preparation to get my mindset in the proper place, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to spend maybe 10 minutes online, and I'm going to get an overview. What, what kind of suffering are we experiencing globally? I spent less than 10 minutes, and this is what I came across. A couple weeks ago, there was an earthquake in Afghanistan that killed over a thousand people, many children. Last night, or yesterday, there was a major earthquake in Iran. There's major flooding in South Chinese provinces that have forced tens of thousands of people to have to evacuate the area, leave their homes, leave everything. There are protests and riots breaking out in Lebanon, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, Argentina, Sri Lanka, because people are getting to the place where they can't afford to buy food anymore. The economy is essentially collapsing in those nations. The UK is pro uh, protesting in the streets because of the cost of living. Israel is living in fear of war, potentially nuclear. 
The Taiwanese people are living in fear of potential attack from China. And this isn't even to mention what has happened in Ukraine with the Russia conflict. There is suffering in the world. There is a tremendous amount of suffering. Like it was said, these are real people that have real families. They have brothers and sisters, they have mothers, they have fathers. There is an amount of suffering here that I can't even comprehend because I haven't come anywhere close to experiencing in my lifetime. That was 10 minutes and that was about all I could stomach of this. But that's the suffering that's going on out there. I'm sure if I were to spend, say, the rest of the morning or the rest of the day with you guys, there's real suffering in this room. It's not just people in other continents or other nations that are experiencing suffering. If I sat down with you and we had a coffee, you'd tell me about the pain and the loss and the suffering that you've experienced yourself or are going through at this very moment. So, do I have a PowerPoint? So what I want to examine from God's Word this morning is how can we faithfully walk through pain, loss, and suffering. How do, we, how do we do that as God's people? And the text that I want us to focus on is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 5. Who's in charge of the thing there? Yeah. So I'll read it, and then we'll, uh, we'll move forward. So this is the word of the Lord. I'm going to give a second for people to arrive there. Or it's, it's written there. But now, this is what the Lord says, who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom. Cush and Seba I in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. From this text, we will see in order to walk faithfully through pain, loss, and suffering, it will be key to ruin a surprise, to be reminded of your self-identity, and finally to remember your Redeemer. So what do we mean by ruining a surprise? So, in preparation for this, I read this text, I don't know, a handful of times, five, ten times. And the thing that really stood out to me in, in these readings was how twice in the passage God says, do not be afraid. So he says twice, do not be afraid. But what stood out to me is that he says, okay, do not be afraid, but you will pass through waters. You will pass through fire. Flooding waters and fierce flames aren't exactly comforting to me. What came to mind was, like, imagine living next to a volcano and someone said, like, that thing's about to blow, but don't worry. That's what came to mind. How can we not be alarmed when we're told from the outset that we will pass through floods of water and fire that burns? If you've read the Bible, and you've paid attention while you're reading the Bible, it's not a book that's written to merely make you feel good. Now, don't get me wrong, there are sweet sections that like make your soul sing, but it's something more akin probably to foul-tasting medicine. It gives you what you need, not necessarily what you want. In this case, what we need to know is that we will we will, 
walk through fire and we will pass through waters. Pain, loss, and suffering are recurrent themes for all of us. They're absolutely inevitable. Sometimes we'll inflict this pain on ourselves. Sometimes it'll be others that'll intentionally hurt us. And other times it seems to unravel in some sort of random way. In any event, if you're not going through something difficult right now, chances are it's just right around the corner. That's the reality of the situation. So why would this be my first point? Why am I stating something so obvious as like, I'm not like wasting your time. Like, why am I telling you something so obvious as you will experience pain, loss, and suffering? Is point one a throwaway point? Actually, I actually don't think it is. I was reading a book uh, written by a clinical psychologist recently, and he tells a story about a man that comes to see him because he was experiencing a prolonged bout of anxiety and depression. He finally gets to the point where he's like, oh, I, I gotta do something, I gotta, I gotta go see somebody about this um, depression. So over the course of therapy, uh, the, the therapist begins to like dig out, like, what's like actually going on in this man's life? So the man tells about a nightly occurrence that is happening to him. He'll wake up in the middle of the night, paralyzed, locked into this fetal position. And he says to the psychologist, it's like sometimes this lasts for hours, hours and hours. He can't move. He's just stuck in this position. So they continue to see each other. He co continues to come back for therapy sessions. And the psychologist is able to like bring up some of the things that he had like perhaps buried quite deeply in his subconscious. The client finally tells a story that he had repressed. He tells about a fight that he had with another man. Somebody who had been quite close to him, somebody who cared about him a lot. The fight was very violent, physical, and the client had suffered emotionally a great deal from this horrible battle. It was very shortly after this fight that these nightly episodes began, began to happen. So they continued to see each other and the picture began to emerge of like, why did this fight have this physiological, psychological impact on this man's life? The man had been raised with a picture-perfect view of life. He was raised to believe that all people were good and that everybody could be trusted. The world was a good and safe place. He also saw himself as somebody who was kind and caring and gentle, and he was the kind of person that could do no harm. For him, the world was a safe place and people were safe. That night of the fight, his illusions about life were shattered. The world isn't harmless. The world isn't perfect. The man that he had that conflict with had true rage in his eyes and was out to maybe even kill him. He saw a violent side to himself that he had never seen before and didn't think was possible. So, the psychologist wrote, unable to deal with the reality of that kind of rage, that kind of anger, that kind of violence, he buried it. And it surfaced in the traumatic episodes that he experienced that night. I share this story with you because it highlights the cost of being naive about living in a world where there is pain, there is loss, and there is suffering. It's a part of how things are. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but when I experience difficult things, the first questions that pop into my mind is like, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? I can't conceptualize why something so horrific would happen to me, even though, theoretically, I believe we live in a dangerous world. But there's a disconnect between the theoretical and the experiential. 
when it comes to horrifying, painful things. So having an outlook, outlook on life that includes the painful aspect can buffer you and help you stay emotionally and spiritually intact when the difficult things inevitably come. In verse 2, he says, God says, we will pass through waters of adversity and fire of suffering and loss. It's better to accept that presence than to be suddenly surprised by it. We don't want to feel lost in a dark forest without a compass. But even though you might know, okay, well, I accept the fact that there's pain and loss and suffering, um, that's not overly helpful in and of itself. In fact, I'm sure if you've thought about it, you know somebody who believes that, yeah, life's horrible, life's painful, life is suffering, and they're cynical and bitter because of it. So just knowing the reality of this isn't necessarily beneficial. You need something more. So this passage also tells us, oh, yeah, you can click on. Maybe I won't even use that. <laughs> this, pulse, this passage also tells us that we need to be reminded of our self-identity. So if we were to look at this text through a different lens, through the lens of, let's say, what do I mean to God or who am I to God, what do we see? We see from this text, maybe go forward, yeah, I, th I think you're actually a bit ahead, so go back. Yes. We see from this text that we are created and formed by God. We see that we are precious and honored in God's sight. We see that we are loved, and we, find, we see finally that we are not abandoned, that he is with us. So remember a few uh, minutes ago on my first point, I said, like, the difficulty that I had when I read this passage, passage the first time is, how can God say twice, do not be afraid, but also say at the very same time, you will pass through raging floods of water and fire? How can God say those two things at the same time in a way that actually makes sense? The more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, maybe my initial understanding of pain, loss, and suffering in the lives of those who are precious to God is incomplete. Maybe there's, maybe there's more to this picture that I failed to see the first time I read this. And I thought, what if this is the case? What if it's the case that you are incalculably pre precious in God's sight? That God honors you and loves you to a degree that you can't even begin to get your mind around. And further, like the text says, that he is actually with you in your pain and loss and suffering. And because of this, your suffering doesn't ruin you, it actually perfects you. Or in the words of this passage, it actually creates you, informs you. As I said, I've worked in campus ministry for 15 years, and the number one question or roadblock or um, number one obstacle in people's lives from believing in a good God is why on earth is life so horribly difficult then? Why is it so painful? What if God in coming into this world as a human being, like you and I, chose not to eliminate suffering from the human experience, but rather he chose to repurpose it. God repurposed suffering in the life of his people so that it becomes a productive force, not a destructive force. That it produces something rather than destroys something. Is this a legitimate question? Like, is there any biblical precedent that God uses suffering as a productive force? tool? And what would it do? What would suffering do? What, it, what, what does it produce? What does it shape? What does it form? I think what it shapes, what it creates, is it creates you into a son or daughter 
of the kingdom of God. It shapes and forms you into something completely new, into something that looks a lot more like Jesus than you currently are now. One of the first verses, strangely enough, that I memorized when I became a Christian is found in Hebrews, the second chapter in the 10th verse. And it says, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus was made perfect through the suffering that he experienced. I mean, it only rationally follows that if the master was made through perfect through the process of suffering, then why wouldn't his followers through the very same means? The Bible is emphatic on this point. Our characters, in fact, our entire beings are shaped through the fires of adversity. That's how we're transformed. That's how we're made new. The most difficult times in life have the power and potential to change you the most. Maybe it's appropriate to share a personal experience with you guys. The past two years have been really, really hard for me. Um, in many ways, I felt like everything that had brought me happiness or meaning or pur purpose, purpose had been stripped away, stripped away from me. I got to some pretty low places in the last two years. My job is social, my, my job is serving, and I sat in a small room and only interacted with people over a screen. It was, hor it was horrible for someone like me. It honestly felt like a nightmare that I just wasn't waking up from. So several months into this darkness, I sense I had to approach this differently. What's the sense of going down the dark tube? So I was in mourning, or sorry, I was, it was the morning and I was in prayer and I approached God with his attitude like, God, I want the absolute high point of my day, every day, to be this time in worship with you. If this can be the absolute pinnacle of my experience, then it doesn't matter what gets taken away. It doesn't matter who I see. It doesn't matter if I never play hockey again or never go to a restaurant again or never go to my job again. The best part of my day can't be taken away. It actually started to work. I actually started to feel like, God, this is truly a reason to get up. This is truly a reason to live. So the big question is, why did it take dark months of isolation and feeling stripped of almost everything for me to finally come to grips with my true identity. I don't know, but it did. It took months and months of hell in order to realize all of life is only you anyways, Jesus. I can worship you from absolutely anywhere. Being loved, being honored, being precious in God's sight is central to our identity. It's the most foundational piece. We are beings created to worship God. That is our core chief identity. My guess is, again, if I had a chance to sit down and have a coffee with you guys, I would hear many stories of how you've been reshaped through pain and loss and suffering. But it's important for you to hear this, that God allows you to walk through your pain because he's using it for your glory. Suffering has been repurposed. It doesn't destroy, it reproduces. It creates something in you that you weren't formerly.
God's chosen instrument to shape you into something magnificent is suffering. Finally, the last point, it's imperative to remember your Redeemer. Here we go. Okay, so where have we been so far? Let's just quickly re reiterate. We know that invariably pain, suffering, loss will come. Um, we know that these, those who follow Christ, these aren't necessarily destructive forces, but rather a productive one. We know that pain, loss, and suffering will produce growth. Growth, it'll reshape us into God's intended design, which is Christ-like. And we know from experience, at least, that having this perspective on pain doesn't come, it's not like a one-off, you just do it once and like you're, you're good. It's this continual wrestling with God. This, and I, my, I would say that wrestling is what produces the depth of relationship with God. I was actually thinking about on the drive over here this morning that Israel means he who wrestles with God. God's, that's, it's fundamental, the wrestling of life's difficulties with God. It's been there since the very outset. So this leads us to the last thing that we need to pay attention to. What does this passage say about God? We have taken a look at what does it say about reality of the pain and suffering? What does it say about us? What does it say about God? God presents himself in this passage as our savior and our redeemer. The language here is one of like business or trade. He redeemed you, ransom, exchange. These terms bring to mind for me the children, of ex the children of Israel's exodus from Egypt. So the key question is, who is this God that tells you not to be afraid during times of pain, loss, and suffering? He says it clearly. He says he is the God who's willing to exchange life for life for you. He is the God that's willing to let others die so that you live. He is the God that is willing to pay a ransom for your life. In fact, he already has. He has done that. The God who loves you and finds you so precious and honorable in his, in, so honorable in his sight, it cost God something to love you so much. True love isn't cheap. Most of you have probably learned that lesson by this point in life. True love isn't cheap. True love is tremendously costly. Why? Because it costs an awful lot of self-sacrifice. Love requires complete, unwavering self-giving. That's what life and love is, definitionally. Your God, my God, Jesus Christ was so intent on loving you and I that he voluntarily chose to become flesh and blood. In doing so, he became vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. If a bullet came through or if I went walking out on the street, this vulnerable body would be crushed. Jesus became vulnerable by taking on flesh and blood like you and I. As a vulnerable being, he experienced the ultimate pain, loss, and suffering firsthand, experientially, in the very same ways that you and I do. He was betrayed by a friend. He experienced physical to torture. He experienced temporary relational loss with his Father in heaven. When, he was, when, he, when the arson was placed on him, he shed blood to the point of physical death. And he did it for you and I. This is the God that asks you, can you trust me? Can you not be afraid in times of suffering? He doesn't say it's going to be easy. He doesn't say it's not going to be painful. But he says, I understand 
because I've been through it too and I'm there with you. The pain and suffering that we see around the world and in this room is going to lead to a magnificent glory that we can scarcely get our heads around. I recognize as a stranger, I don't, I don't know the personal struggles in this room. My guess is that they're substantial. They're substantial in my life, they're substantial in the people's lives around me. My guess is there is substantial pain in this very room this morning. But we have a God who cares. And a God who doesn't just care by words, but a God who cares with action. There is no other God who has suffered for his people. There is no other God like Jesus. Let me pray for us. Jesus, there truly is none like you. You deserve all praise and all glory forevermore. And Lord, thank you for the hope that you can give us in suffering because the world's not a good place and it doesn't, to me, seem like it's getting much better. And that's not just happening out there, it's happening right in here. Lord, I pray these words and these truths from your scripture would be a comfort to us. Would they help us patiently endure our suffering? Would they give us a meaning or a purpose no matter what we're going through? And would they even do the impossible of give us, giving us a joy and the ability to rejoice no matter how difficult it gets? Because you have the final answer over death and suffering. It's in Christ's name and to his honor and glory I pray. Amen. Thanks, you guys. This is a moment that we share together in our tradition about once a month. This is important to us. This matters. This has genuine meaning for those of us who have accepted Christ's lordship in our lives, have acknowledged what Rod was talking about, about the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. These elements that we share together from the table mean something. I hope that if you are one who understands that meaning that you will feel free to share these elements with us this morning and just as rod has said this morning so so put it so well he said that god repurposes suffering and there is no better example of that repurposing of suffering than what jesus went through on our behalf and for the healing and restoration and redemption that flowed from his suffering. So Chris and Rob are going to come forward. We're going to uh, serve the bread. And then I ask you to hold your bread so that we can eat it together. Uh, while the elements are being distributed, we will sing a hymn, a verse of the hymn. And uh, I think it'll be a familiar one to us all. A good old one. So we'll not be cross. So.
Apostle Paul, who was not there that night, just as we were not there that night, tells us these words. I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant, established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's drink together in remembrance. church where at the end of communion services when they had these cups everybody would break their cup as a just an extra little reminder that Jesus was broken for us and also that there is no greater purpose for which these little cups can be put to use than for us to remember Jesus if you would like to do that feel free For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, but we also proclaim his life, his life which he lived for us and which continues in us. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the way you repurpose suffering. Sometimes we use the word redeem, but repurpose maybe is more familiar to us. It's taking something that was intended for something and giving it a new use, a new life, a new purpose. And we thank you for the ways that you repurpose our suffering to make us more like you and for the way that you repurposed your own suffering to give us the opportunity for new life. And we thank you. Let's 
sing the final hymn, final chorus of that hymn will be on the screen. Doxology. I hope you know this. Um, we'll just sing it a cappella. 